on behalf of Festival Director Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome back to GLF's Brave New World. For those of you who missed our earlier sessions featuring Margaret Atwood, Oran Pamuk, Jhumpa Lahiri, Toby Walsh, Jaspreet Bindra, Lakshmi Puri, Gloria Steinem, and so many others, you can catch these on our Facebook page, JLF Lit Fest, or on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. Our official radio partner is Red FM, Bajati Raho. Our next session is The Absence of Justice. John Ralston Saul in conversation with Manjushri Thapa. The asymmetrical power structures across cultures and continents have only been further reinforced in the times of the pandemic as individuals and societal conflicts deepen by the day. Manjushri Thapa, political philosopher and public intellectual John Ralston Saul speaks of the need to address these imbalances through dialogue and negotiation, reconciliation and restitution. John Ralston Saul is an award-winning essayist and novelist, considered to be Canada's leading public intellectual. In the collapse of globalism, Saul predicted the 2007-2008 economic crisis years before it happened, as well as the current rise of populism and xenophobia. A longtime champion of freedom of expression, Saul was elected president of Penn International from 2009 to 2015 the only Canadian writer elected to this position in 97 years. Manjushri Thapa is the author of 10 books of fiction, non-fiction and literary translation. Her latest novel is All of Us in Our Own Lives, set in the cynical moneyed world of international aid in Nepal. Her essays have appeared in the New York Times, the London Review of Books, Newsweek and The Globe and Mail. Please do remember to comment and ask questions by typing it in the comment section below. And Manjushri will pose these at the end to John Ralston Saul. In case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. And of course, if we drop off, just hang in there. We promise you, as we've done before, we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, the absence of justice, John Ralston Saul in conversation with Manjushri Thapa. John Manjushri, over to you. Thank you, um, Sanjoy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, John. Hi, good morning, Manjushri. <laughs> um, can you tell us where you are? You've got that beautiful landscape behind you. I'd love to, uh, the audience to know where you are. Well, I'm sitting up on a small island uh, on Georgian Bay, which is a, 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 a UNESCO protected area several hours north of Toronto, and it's an area just rife with every form of wildlife, believe it or not, from poisonous snakes to beautiful birds and 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 uh, wonderful water. So it's uh, it, this is in terms of a pandemic, you couldn't be more isolated. They're just my wife and I, and and the wildlife. And um, you know, wonderful. I'm uh, talking to you from Toronto, which of course um, has been the indigenous homelands of many different groups of of First Nations before and. Um, I wanted to, you know, before we talk, uh, before I sort of uh, steer you towards talking about the present moment, I would really like to uh, talk, frame our discussion with the thought that, you know, Canada enjoys this global image of being a almost spotless, you know, perfect country that has really worked everything out. Um, but of course, as you have written about, um, and as many people who have a critical relationship to Canada know, it's um, far from perfect. And particularly in terms of its foundational uh, sins, let's say, in the way that the United States was founded on the um, uh, eradication of many First Nations and on slavery, Canada has been built basically on stolen land or on broken treaties and sort of broken promises. Now you've written about this a lot in A Fair Country and in The Comeback, which I read and found extremely helpful for orienting me towards this dissonance between Canada's international image as a, a, a very fair country and its uh, ground reality where it has a lot of um, failures still going on. Could you sort of situate us in the moral position that Canada occupies right now? 
Well, you know, I think that you know, the, the concept of the Western nation state, which we're all stuck in because of the, the, all those European empires, which in a sense left us in those structures, which are extremely unuseful structures because they demand a, a oneness. So India still struggles with how can you be one when you've got so many things? And, you know, Canada has found, all of us have tried to find ways out of it. Uh, and we sort of found part of a way with uh, 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 francophone, anglophone, and and immigration, but of course buried out of sight for the longest time uh, the reality of the indigenous peoples who were not reduced to uh, nothingness as they were in the United States through wars, but were in a sense hidden from public sight through the betrayal of, of a series of treaties over the last 150 years despite the fact they'd never been conquered. And that for 300 years before that, really people like me had lived here either thanks to indigenous people or in partnership with them. And it wasn't until the late 19th century that, uh, that if you like, the English tradition in particular uh, was started being really applied to trying to make them disappear, be, a, be uh, 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 absorbed, uh, uh, hidden, and that their land would be, of course, used by the newcomers, the settlers. And really, what you've seen over the last 120 years is an incredible fight, what I call a comeback, uh, by the indigenous people, because they have, unlike the United States Australia, and Australia, uh, no, more like New Zealand, they have the treaties. And th they have all sorts of legal basis. So there's been this fight. It's been very difficult. and but there's an enormous amount which has not yet been done. There are enormous problems of, of poverty, of, of, uh, of not proper services for um, uh, isolated. We have many, many isolated communities, which most countries can't even imagine that are fly-in only uh, communities. And, um, and, and the federal government has not done its job quite the, once it got over actually being destructive, it then moved into the phase of not doing its job which is in a way just almost as bad because then you're admitting that you're doing wrong, but you're not doing anything about it. And, in, and then gradually since 1960, a series of actions have been taken largely because indigenous people have fought back so effectively. And, and I have to say that if I were to look around Canada in the 1960s and say, what's the most interesting leadership group in the country? I would have said Quebecers, the young Quebecers, you know, mad as hell, lean, fighting, will not give up, and will punch you in the face if you don't, you know, really keep going. And today, the equivalent is the Indigenous leadership. They have an amazing, amazing leadership from very young to quite senior, like Judge Sinclair in the Senate. And, you know, the, the fight is by no means over. What's changed in the last decade is more and more non-Indigenous Canadians have woken up to the fact that their own educations told them nothing about any of this. And it's, 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 it's out there now. I mean, I, even as recently as say seven years ago, the National Broadcaster, CBC, had a meeting saying, what should we do? We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. We don't have any programmation. It was really embarrassing. And I was at the meeting with a lot of my indigenous friends and we just sort of rolled our eyes. And now CBC is filled with indigenous stuff. And a lot of it is very angry and, and it needs to be angry. Yeah. But, <laughs> but the anger is also balanced with the fact that, you know, from 1960s, almost zero Indigenous kids in university. Today, it'd be close to 40,000. Plus, you know, uh, professors everywhere. So it's a, it's a mix of quite a big elite breakthrough, but really not a breakthrough at the ground level on the well-being of people. And a lot, work, a lot of work that needs still to be done. Can I ask you, you know, so I, I moved, I'm what Canada calls a new Canadian, a citizen of maybe four years. And um, for me, it certainly was eye-opening to uh, read people like Lee Maracol or Tanya Talega or, you know, the many, as you say, there's a sort of um, indigenous renaissance happening right now, culturally and intellectually, also politically in Canada. And so it's been very uh, educative for me to follow it and to learn from it. Um, and of course, 
famously Justin Trudeau's promise to create a sort of nation to nation relationship and to you know, honor the treaties that have not been honored in the past. Um, that was very exciting, I, I, I would say. Um, and yet there, you know, you mentioned that there is a sort of elite breakthrough at some level, but you of course um, occupy a space in Canadian society, which is um, close to the elite, let's say. Um, and so uh, what I'm seeing is that the anger and the sort of moral calls of the indigenous people are really not being listened to at all and the pace, of change um, at the elite level um, is extremely slow. And there's a sort of um, eroding of trust between, and there has been for many, many years, of course, but uh, especially now as Justin Trudeau has failed to act on the nation to nation uh, promise that he made uh, to create that kind of relationship with the 600 more indigenous nations uh, that Canada has. Um, so can you explain what the resistance is at the at the elite level or at the level of the state to actually you know acting upon the promises that the state has already made that so many recommendations so many inquiries so many um uh studies have made what is the resistance if, if i if i could just say what what's fascinating is that and and, and i think if i could just say i know it, it from the outside it looks like i have this ability to open doors and make phone calls. In fact, you know, apart from six years in Ottawa, I've, I've basically, my whole life is as a, crit a critic of all of that. And that's what I write as a critic. I know how it works. A lot of writers don't actually understand as much how it works, you know, but that's what I write about. I write about how power works, whether it's in, in any country I know, or generally speaking in the world and in Canada. Uh, let's just say this, you know, it's fascinating this is, you know, uh, Jaipur is a, is, a, is a cultural festival. The first breakthrough was in culture. I mean, really, the, 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 the art, the plastic arts, the breakthrough of Indigenous people in the plastic arts is amazing. A large part of the way in which Canadians imagine themselves is through Indigenous art. You know, it, BC, uh, the Arctic, it's astonishing. They did that without actually having any understanding of the politics that were so wrong. And then the, the breakthrough in education, which has come surprisingly fast. I'm not saying it's done, it's not done, but the, it's actually the, the power of the indigenous voice in the universities is, it's, it's small, but it's very powerful and, and, and it's moving really quite fast, not fast enough, but really quite fast. Um, the politics is the hardest, because that's when you get to uh, interests and power and people giving up things. And I've always said there's no such thing as reconciliation without restitution. And I've always said that in negotiations with indigenous people, if, if, if a nation is asking for 10,000 square kilometers and $50 billion, instead of wasting years in court, uh, just double the amount and settle. I mean, we have nothing to gain by arguing about these things. And we've got this, the money and we have, and there is the, the amount of land. And I, I think it's putting together, you think about the women's movement, how long it's taken, how little, how little progress has been made considering what should have happened by now, really, how hard it's been. And, and so now this is the really the tough nut where um, I don't think the Trudeau government has been sophisticated enough or smart enough about what to do first and how to do it. I don't think they're of bad faith. I think they actually believe, first government in the history of Canada to actually believe that something needed to be done, but I think they didn't figure out how to do it. They should have started by addressing what I call the human rights issues, which are the issues of poverty, of education, of housing, of water. Start with the what I called in the comeback, the easy stuff, just get it done. Just do it really fast and then turn with, with some of the, 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 with most of the human rights stuff off the table, start with the really, the philosophical, the political, the, the, the larger rights. But they did it the other way around, more or less, which was, I think, a terrible mistake, which has caused the blockage and the confusion, I think. But, but the other thing is, is that 
you know, when you have to make a major change, which involves accepting all the wrongs, which has been done, that you, the responsibility, that's been done, but it actually, how do you turn a whole uh, country's political system, power system, administrative system, justice system around to do something else? Um, it, 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 it involves uh, an enormous amount of change. First of all, it involves bringing in an enormous number of indigenous people to be part of it. If they're not there in a critical mass, it's not gonna happen. And I've seen this happen. It happened, for example, between French Canada and Anglophone Canada, uh, when they, there was nobody above, hardly anybody above Colonel in the, who was a Francophone in the army. And suddenly in about one week, they promoted a raft of French Canadians, which meant that a whole bunch of Anglophones were not gonna get promoted. And they were furious, a lot of them resigned, and, but the army was changed and it went off it was the beginning of the civil service radically changing. Well, we haven't had that kind of movement in the Ministry of Justice, for example, where the judges, the, the judges, the lawyers who are in charge of the negotiations are a bunch of, you know, the wrong people for this day. Let's put it politely. Just they should be off, set off to do traffic, you know, and bring in a lot of young, long, young lawyers who really are on the right side. So I don't think that that I don't think there are the people who understand how to do this quite. And the result is it's created more anger and disappointment because it's hard to go really fast when changes like this have to be made. So you have to be very, very uh, strategic and tactical about one, two, three, four. And so we're now there's now there's confusion and disappointment, which is really, really too bad. But but you know, this new generation are are, as I said, really mad, really smart, really determined, and it will happen. Yeah, I mean that's for me the most exciting thing about living in Canada now and being Canadian is seeing a country that's really ripe to transform itself out of a sort of settler. Uh, colonial uh, state into, you know, something non-racist, something non-settler colonial, and to really uh, reimagine itself and 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 to change completely. Um, and and just was, not yes. not to make a comparison, but but a, a lot of work where the where the most interesting social political work has been done is on the idea that. You, you, there's that the European idea of the oneness, the u, u, uniform nation state, simply doesn't work, and that you know everybody has to be as people are still saying in the United States or France or England, you know, what is it to be British? What is it to be, you know? And there's this sort of phony definition. This goes back hundreds of years. But Canada has broken away from that to a great extent. Not, I hate the word multiculturalism. I think it's a silly word. Uh, it, and it, it never was meant to work the way it's defined. But the, the idea that I can go around in halls and say, you know, that we, we have to accept that uh, we live in a multiple personality order, that you can have multiple loyalties, multiple identities, that we are, we're the citizens are the source of legitimacy. If we want to be more than one thing, we can be more than one thing. So you can see it's it's not that different from the fight going on in India in a way, except that argument is still really winning in Canada. But the big flaw in it, apart from uh, whole areas of racism, the big flaw in it is that the, the, the really the founding pillar of the whole place, the indigenous peoples, um, that has not been dealt with. It's 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 being dealt with, but it's being dealt with too slowly and probably not in the right way. So, you know, just uh, listening to you, uh, you know, you get this very clear sense of exactly how difficult it is to make a big cultural national shift. Um, and of course, right now we're in the you know middle of this COVID-19 pandemic. So I want to shift to discussing, you know, the difficulty and also the opportunities that the, the uh, pandemic is presenting to reimagine the global order anew. Um, which is, of course, a hugely um, ambitious thing. Now, I'm originally from Nepal, and uh, the economy of Nepal is based on sort of the labor of the most exploited class possibly in the world, which is the migrant worker who goes to the Middle East and works for you know, a pittance and uh, with very few labor rights at all. 
Um, and so the global order before the pandemic was based on you know, the exploitation of large classes of people and this untenable growing wealth of a few. Um, and now, of course, we're seeing how, how, how unsustainable, I mean, it was always clear, but, um, but now we've seen in particular how the poor, the vulnerable, even within nations, but also internationally, are really being targeted by the pandemic and by, by you know, the fact that their governments are not protecting them or, or that the global order is not protecting them and is very unjust. So could you um, talk, now you've written about this, uh, about the uh, uh, reinvention of the world and the collapse of globalism in 2005 before the 2008 collapse. So could you talk now about uh, the international global order and, you know, is there a chance that, that you know, this pandemic will allow us to reimagine the global order? Well, look, you know, I think that the situation we're in has been obvious since about 1995. And I know I, when I wrote Voltaire's Bastards, it's already 1993 talking about if we don't do something, we're going to see a return of racism, populism, ugly nationalism. If I could write a 900 page book or whatever it is, appalling, you know, that early, saying that all of that was going to happen. I wasn't the only one thinking it, and it wasn't hidden. So again, it's a kind of blockage of a power system that was, was not yet, uh, had not yet hit enough defeats that people felt confident enough that they could suggest something else. And what would that something else be? And what would the universities teach about what that something else could be to prepare new people to lead? And, um, and, you know, so I remember in Australia in, in 1999 giving a, a big na a speech on national television that saying globalism is over. And in 2008, 7, 8, when the crisis happened, it was clear that it was not only over, but had been over for some time and that we were in a kind of vacuum. And that if we didn't do something, it was going to become more and more explosive. So in a way, this virus is another manifestation because of things come out of nowhere, right? Crises come out of nowhere. Well, 2007, eight seemed to come out of nowhere. This seems to come out of nowhere. In fact, neither of them came out of nowhere. We knew a virus was coming. We knew a financial crisis was coming. What was disastrous was that because we were in total denial, because of the, if you like, the international system, we were not prepared for it. And in fact, not at all prepared for it. So, now I think it is completely obvious to everybody that the system in place since 1973 uh, has failed. It does not work. It has not produced shared wealth. It has not produced uh, uh, egalitarianism. It has not improved education for more. It has not improved work conditions. It's taken us back to pre-1929 and in many cases to about 1845, you know, what you're describing with Nepal is that you're, you're really describing 18, pre-1850 really is what you're describing in terms of the methodology. That all came out of this supposed modern system called globalism. So now it's clear to everybody that it doesn't work. The danger is that the people who benefit most for it, listen to them. They want to rush back into work. Why? Well, largely, not just because of money, largely because they're terrified that the movement for changes will get enough momentum that it might happen. And if, for example, look at the airplane industry, you know, you know they, they're rolling back everything with a few excuses that they've done things, whereas in fact, it's incredibly dangerous to fly and they just want to go back to the way it once was. Uh, which, which is a very fascinating conversation for another for another time because it's it, it has to do with the exploitation of old people and so on. Um, I, I'll give you a, a key point in this: debt. You know, for a lot the whole through the globalist period, we were told that we were indebting ourselves and therefore we had to cut back, cut back, cut back. In fact, what's happened right now? We've a, a whole bunch of money has been spent, right, almost everywhere. Gigantic amounts of money. But the point is, we didn't borrow that money. We, it is not debt. 
We did not borrow it. We printed it. It's just printed money. You and I, who own the government, asked our government, since we elected them, to print money. And they printed money. So there is no debt. What there is, is paper money. And the way in which that is handled will tell you where we're going. It is entire, and I'm not being funny here, it is entirely possible that serious countries get together without the United States, unless they change the government, um, and, and simply have a big meeting, say at Versailles, with a lovely big Louis XIV desk, and they all sign wonderful scrolled pieces of paper saying, we have printed X trillion dollars, and we will pay it back in 250 years, and they sign it, and they put it in a drawer of the desk, lock the drawer, and throw away the key. It's over. If they turn it into debt and sell it in the marketplace, then the, the, the people who have, in a sense, caused the crisis will have won and have turned it into yet another tool that will have to do with more poverty. And that's just an example of the fight that we're actually in the middle of. This is not over. It could go either, either way. The rich-poor thing is going to be the, the toughest one. It has to do with tax law. It has to do with employment standards. It has to do with rules. It has to do with bylaws and corporations. And, and, and as long as, and, and, and so it, 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 it'll depend on whether, as we move into the second wave of this pandemic, whether uh, the, the citizens, citizenry fall into the trap of more populism and allow the populace to divide us by using racism and, you know, it's their fault, and things like that, so that we never get our act together to elect governments or force governments to do what needs to be done. But it can be done. We have to be very, very strong. Well, so, you know, you must be observing all of the movements that are happening right now. The Black Lives Matter movement in the United States is very prominent. Absolutely. Um, and and they've taken place all over the world, really. Um, I know it's in South the Dalit rights movement um, is, is going very strong also in Nepal and India. Um, in India, there's a very strong movement to try and protect the rights of minorities, including Muslims who are um, not uh, uh, being uh, uh, treated particularly fairly right now. Um, and so, you know, there are all these movements going on. Um, it's possible that they might break through, but there's also a very strong resistance to them. And so how do you, are you optimistic at this moment or do you feel like it could go either way? It could go either way. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's great that it's happening. And I think that, you know, we all have to be ready to go into the streets and we all have to be say to ourselves, I'm ready to go to prison. And I have to say, during the six years I was president of Penn, I always went out with the idea that, that we would go into the streets whenever we needed to, and if we ended up in prison or something worse, that's what it would be, right? But of course, you know, someone who looks like me is less likely to end up in prison, no matter how, how badly I act, right? <laughs> you know, sort of thing. And I'm perfectly conscious of that, and therefore I know I can act, right? But it, it which shows you the courage of the people who know the kind of violence that lies before them. And um, so I think the Black Lives Matter thing has been wonderful because it's the latest, if you like, wave, which has had both incredibly important in the United States, but has had an international uh, impact, and which is fantastic. Um, but there are two parts to it. One is really that, and I've been saying this now for years, and, and I only say that not because I, I told you so, but because, I mark things, I say to myself, I started saying this and are, are we getting anywhere? And I'm not, again, many of my friends saying the same thing. Um, going into the streets is an essential part of being a citizen and being angry. And, 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 and you have the right to shout at policemen. There is no reason why you can't shout at a policeman. You have every right to do that. But, but change comes from power. You, and one of the disasters of globalization was that now three or four generations of young people convinced themselves that power was dirty and corrupt, which it was, um, and therefore they shouldn't go near it and they should be stand off from it and criticize it. But unfortunately, 
you can't actually make laws and budgets change if you don't hold power. You've got to go into power and, and actually change. It's not about changing it from within. It's, cha it's taking control of how societies work. This is not easy. This is really tough. But I think you're seeing signs that young, younger generations are now willing to ruin their lives by going into politics. <laughs> because that's what it is, it ruins your life, unless you're completely corrupt and you become a millionaire out of it. If you're an honest politician, it ruins your family, your children hate you, you have a divorce, it, the whole thing, it's terrible. But that is how you make change. And I think we're getting close to the moment when there will be a rush on the political parties. That, you know, after all, the right wing took power by doing coup d'etats inside political parties. Perfectly decent conservative parties were taken over by the extreme right in country after country after country. And there's no reason why they can't, by part, why parties can't be taken over again. So that decision to go for power is going to decide whether we come out of this going in another direction. If we just sit back relying on us being angry, that they'll just wait us out. Mm. They'll wait until we have no more money, until we can't afford to be in the streets, and they'll just continue on with mm. nice words, and they'll continue on. I think the other thing is that there are some really precise things, and the police are one of the most important. One of the most surprising evolutions during the period of globalization, where the argument was the nation state doesn't matter, the citizen doesn't matter, money matters interest matter, was that during that whole period, uh, police were turned into militarized forces in terms of, of, of the, 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 what they drive, what they can pull out, it's military equipment, the way they dress, the way they act. I mean, these are some, what were they preparing for? I mean, this is what the question I asked myself for decades now. What are they preparing for? These are the police forces that are supposed to bring safety. They're preparing themselves for a civil war. Against whom? Against you and me. Starting, of course, with people who aren't white, right? With the classic forms of racism. And so the Black Lives Matter is a, is a, a, a sign but, uh, you know, at the same time, the COVID has brought, up, brought back anti-Asian, uh, East Asian racism, you know, because the people who are racist can't tell the difference between Chinese and Vietnamese and whatever, you know. So it's just sort of anybody who is sort of, you know, the peril, right? They're now the enemy and they can be attacked in public. So what, what, what we have to do something about the police. This is not a side issue. This is a central issue. And when they see, say defund the police, I think what they're really saying is demilitarize and, 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 and strip out what is the job of the police versus a whole bunch of other services. And um, uh, you know, what personally for me has been so horrifying is, and, and this is where the technology has helped us to actually see how these police act in country after, not just in the United States, in Canada, in country after country after country, they just pull out their guns and shoot, and shoot to kill. I mean, what you're talking about is a problem with who is uh, uh, chosen to go into police. Not everybody, but how are they trained? The answer is they're not trained at all, or they're very, very badly trained. Um, they don't even know how to shoot a gun. They're only taught to shoot to kill. Um, when faced as a, a, a young uh, a Syrian kid who was mentally unstable, this is a moment when, I don't know, a lot of us just went bang on a streetcar in Toronto, was shot um, eight times by a police officer. He had a little knife in his hand. And, and, and what I noticed was that police officer was surrounded by five or six or seven police officers who did nothing to stop it. So there's something really wrong in the way the police are structured in country after country after country. And if we don't deal with that, if, if, the, if we go into the second wave of COVID and populism continues, there's going to be real dangers in the street. And we have to uh, prepare for that by ensuring that the police are not free to act in this way. Yeah, that's a, a wonderful point. I, you know, before we go to audience questions, 
Um, I just wanted to ask you, you know, so again, as with, uh, let's say, the health care system or with the education system, you know, un until there's child care, people really can't go back to work particularly well. So, you know, this rush, as you say, to get back to normal or to go back to the way things were is part of the danger. So what would be, what would justice look like? What would, let's say, as you suggested, you know, a bunch of countries get together, um, uh, borrow money against the future, make a deal through, you know, just just use the money in a way to create a just world. What would that world look like? Well, I think, you know, you have to look at, at a strategy of it. The fact is, as China demonstrated, we can produce enough goods to, I'll, I'll exaggerate on purpose, we can produce enough goods to serve the needs of the world in about two cities in China. So, so why is it that people are working harder than ever in countries around the world, right? We, we've solved the problem of production. We're in surplus production. We don't need to be working as hard. So in, what we need to do is turn away from the way this has been misused against workers and say this is an incredible opportunity uh, to, to rethink what a person's life look like, looks like. In Western countries, life expectancy has doubled in the last century, almost, right, in West. And there's been no thinking about what would people's lives look like. And the answer is that people need to work probably half of what they used to work. It's a matter of how the money is distributed, how the tax systems work. And that has to be decided at a national and an international level. And, and if it doesn't take the whole world, it only takes about five or six important countries to say, we're going to use the tax system differently. We're going to use the in income and the uh, employment system differently. And we're going to, we're going to say that, that that spare time, which is the wrong phrase, should be about citizenry, citizen engagement. It's not just about goofing off. Or having holidays, yes, holidays. But but actually, the whole role of the citizenry is the thing that needs to be focused on now. If you actually said we now have time for citizen engagement, about half the time, mm -hmm. on an unpaid basis, on a volunteer basis, because you're properly paid, because the money of of the the money earned doesn't simply go to the owners; it goes to the citizenry. That's easily done by an electable government. That could, people have been talking about that since, nine, since just after the First World War. I mean, uh, Wilfrid Laurier was Prime Minister of Canada for 15 years and then leader of the opposition in 1919, just before an election, which he would have won, he died before, but just before, he started getting major speeches saying the time has come to put workers on the boards of directors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are not new ideas. They've been sabotaged again and again and again. Now we could actually, because of COVID, if we seize it right, get together a small group of countries who actually believe this could be done. And it's pretty easy to name those countries. It's not that hard. We'll say, look, we're gonna, we're gonna do this differently. We're gonna split the money differently. We're gonna do the taxes differently. We're gonna do the trade differently. And I don't think it would be that complicated. I think all the rules, all the all the ideas of how to do it are there. Um, but the 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 money has been spent to make it seem as if this would be irresponsible and far left. It's not even far left, frankly. It's middle of the road. It's sensible. Well. That sounds great to me. Uh, I'm going to. Um, <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy, but it could be done. <laughs> it sounds wonderful. I'm, I'm here for that. Um, so uh, we've got a couple of audience questions. I'm going to ask you the first one, um, which I'm not sure you're uh, going to be in a position to really answer, but um, here it is. Om is asking in, in India and um, many other tribal communities are suffering in India on account of their land being occupied for mining, et cetera. This right. has resulted in uh, indigenous people, which in India, the parallel tribals, yeah. falling between the crossfires and the Maoists and the government. Uh, right. What's the solution? Um, 
could you talk to that at all or would you like to talk about it in relation to maybe the Canadian state's relation to what um, I think Alicia Elliott has called uh, extraction mentalities and my, you know, the sort of resource-based yeah. economy well, here. Well, well, yeah, I mean, that's not a bad way of putting it. I mean, the fact is that, you know, India, I'm not an expert in India, but I've been, you know, a lot and, and I know a bit and I've read a lot, a reasonable amount. Um, I mean, it's funny because India, when you come right down to it, lands which are not urban or rural lands, it, you know, is intensely in uh, rural lands, uh, extraction, the extraction men mindset or uh, tends to take over because it feels like it's out of sight and it can get away with what it wants. And um, these tend to be lands where indigenous people have been pushed to a great extent and, uh, and they get away with it. And it's really, again, it's a question of governments and therefore it's the citizenry stopping thinking about themselves and, oh my God, my city or, oh my God, my university and saying indigenous issues are of central importance and you can't, in countries where there are important, where there are indigenous populations, you cannot have an honest government if you do not take indigenous issues seriously and take this issue of extractive uh, industries seriously. And it it, 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 it it doesn't mean you stop extracting completely, but it does mean that you apply a whole bunch of rules that have to do with the environment. It has to do with education, it has to do with jobs for indigenous people if they want them, but not just the low level jobs, which is what the companies try to get away with. It, it's, it's a form of treaty that has to take place. But the real answer to it, frankly, is, and I think we're gradually getting to this in Canada very late in the day, is that the more power the indigenous people have over those lands, the more they get to tell the extraction companies what is allowable and what isn't. It shouldn't be distant governments giving out, you know, rights to mine. It has to be the indigenous people themselves who control their lands completely and are able to uh, uh, say no or say yes, but under these conditions or only this. And, and I think that's coming very slowly in Canada. I mean, don't even get me going. But, but you know, in India, I don't know enough, but I do know about the, the rebellions as a result of the mistreatment. So it seems like it's an issue which has not been addressed because it's for, for the urban populations who are so filled with themselves as the answer to the world's needs, as the cities are the, are the future. Well, I'm sorry, there are enormous parts of the population which don't live in cities, in which urban populations are maybe romantic about, but they don't know very much about and are not willing to give up something serious in order to make sure that those uh, areas are, 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 are properly um, not looked after, but able to look after themselves. Yeah. Uh, another question is from Chiara uh, asking, how according to you, can the youth bring a change in mindsets so that future generations don't see such discrimination? Well, I mean, it's what we talked about really, which is, you know, you, you, if you're in a democracy, then, you know, you are the source of legitimacy. What does that mean? It means you're a citizen. You, you need to take as much time as you can as a citizen to drive the debate in those directions, if it means going in the street, if it means being, you know, doing all of that, but it does mean seeking power. It does mean putting yourself on the line in terms of power. It's only through power that you can make serious change because otherwise the guys in power are just sitting there saying, you know, I, 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 I'm being a little unkind, but that's okay. Just they're sitting there saying to each other, give it another six months, you know, what do we have to get, what do we have to give them to get through the next six months? When do you think they'll run out of uh, money, you know? Don't, the, if they can't get their degrees, you know, or if they lose their jobs, you know. So it really is about, it really is about power. And if you look at the history of the rise of democracy, flawed though it is, it's all about citizens organizing themselves in a whole series of ways in order to get power 
and direct influence over power. And if you look at the women's movement, which is such an interesting thing to look at as a parallel, it's very rarely talked about how tough it was. And really it's only once you got a critical mass of women in parliaments that things really started to change. And I remember when the constitution in Canada in 82 was really sort of jigged and the men sat down together and they were all these things, pieces of paper they were putting in and things were falling on the floor. And, and, at, the, and, and at the last minute, guess what? The piece of paper that said women, guaranteed women's rights fell on the floor and they didn't even notice. And it came out and, and there was, and, and, and I think within 24 hours, I'd have to go back and look. All the women in the House of Commons, cabinet ministers from all parties, went on strike, basically stood up and said went on strike. And I remember one, the, the Social Democratic Premier of Saskatchewan, who had signed this thing, was a great guy, Blakeney. And so Saskatchewan's a long way away from people who aren't Canadian, from, from Ottawa. His wife went on CBC News in Regina, in, Sask in Saskatchewan, and said, just tell my husband that he needn't bother coming home. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know more or less. And, it, it, and, they, and guess what? They found the piece of paper on the floor and they put it back in. So it's a, it's, it's a matter of they had the power because they had a critical mass of women in parliament. And that was the beginning of a new wave of women's rights. And it's still not over, you know? Mm. Uh, there's uh, hopefully time for one more question, um, which is asked by Sachdev Ramkrishna, uh, saying, you're such a champion of the freedom of expression. What could be done more about the protection of smaller and endangered languages and cultures whose loss you believe is the ultimate removal of freedom. And of course, India has, you know, 4,000 mm -hmm. languages. Yeah. Nepal has 123. Canada has many, if you could answer that. We have about 80, uh, I mean, it's an approximate number, but about 80 indigenous languages. Um, well, the, the answer is that I do believe that the removal and the death of a language is the loss but one of the most profound losses of freedom of expression that you can imagine. It's also a loss of, in, of, of intelligence because each of these languages is a way of understanding something which we do not have the ability to understand in other languages. So it's a loss of an incredibly valuable a part of all of our, our, all of our lives, whether we know the language or not. Um, and I think it's, um, it, again, this is an issue which has to be put on the table. You see that what I talked about right at the beginning, the monolithic concept of the nation state that came from England and France in particular, they're particularly to blame their empires um, because they were so much about only our language matters, right? Um, that we have to completely reverse that in our own minds, that nation states can exist actively with multiple languages. And they don't have to be the official language, but they have to be important. And it's about putting money into those languages, into the teaching of those languages. It's about um, schooling. It's about te creating teachers. So all of this is programming. And I mean, we're seeing it in Canada now that you know, it, literally 20 years ago, there was no federal or provincial money for indigenous languages, nothing. Today, there's a bill going, I can't remember if it's gone through parliament. It's not good enough, it's not enough money. There's actually a bill going through parliament for the protection of indigenous languages. You can now go into public schools in many parts of Canada where indigenous languages are being taught, not necessarily on, in, on indigenous land, in the cities. I think I told you this when we were chatting yesterday, my grandson uh, was going into high school in the center of Toronto and he was allowed to, you know, all the courses are obligatory except for two, and there's a list of choices. And I said, well, what's, what are the choices? And he read through the choices. This is in the center of a city of seven and a half million people, I think. And, and, he, and he got to O, and it was Ojibwe, one of the indigenous languages. I said, wow, you know. So, I mean, this can be done. This can be turned around. But it is a matter of the people who have the money and the power accepting that this is really important and that the indigenous people need to speak these languages, minorities need to speak, have these languages, but we all gain something by understanding them to some extent or choosing part of it or knowing somebody who chooses part of it. And, and part of the thing that needs to be done, and that's the last word is, they'll say is that 
uh, it, it, it's more complicated in India because there's so many. But in many countries, New Zealand has been particularly good at this. It's bringing the indigenous languages, for example, into the main, the, the controlling languages. Right. It's reinventing the language by which we function so that it contains actually, you know, words and ideas which we admit are coming from these other languages. So people start to have pride in the fact that, you know, hey, I come from a country where, you know, we have 17 uh, languages with concepts which we're bringing into the public debate. It's a wonderful thing. Something to be proud of, not to be frightened of. It's only that English French tradition of elimination and monolithic power, which has made this so difficult. Mm. Yeah, it's um, it's. It, I mean, I you know, this is all very inspiring um, for me. It's it's uh, a, a lot of it echoes the thoughts that I have about Nepal, for example, which for many years uh, imposed the Nepali language as the national language. And there are 123 languages and so many intelligence systems and so much knowledge outside of that one language. Um, and so it's wonderful to to imagine that, you know, maybe Canadian English would one day sort of be able to incorporate or not incorporate, but but sort of, you know, mix with uh, all of these other languages that were here before English arrived. Um, Let me so, just add, can I just add one tiny thing, which yeah. is what's so fascinating is that, you know, the European sourced philosophies have nothing in them, nothing in them, which takes us, you know, man, now, now admitted to be not just man, um, uh, off their pedestal to live with nature. And the whole environmental debate is why we're not going anywhere is because European philosophy doesn't contain within it the capacity to moderate ourselves when faced by nature. It's all about defeating nature. Indigenous uh, philosophies in Canada, for example, are filled with philosophical concepts of the oneness of things, which are very serious and very complex. And so what is old fashioned and outdated today are Immanuel Kant and, you know, and, and, and Descartes. They're completely yesterday's men because they don't understand, they are not capable of understanding what the crisis is about. Whereas a uh, a whole a whole bunch of indigenous philosophies are now not only modern, but postmodern because they deal completely in a very serious way with the relationship between people and place and nature. They're very valuable to all of us, very powerful for all of us. We need to have them within our, we should be teaching them within our philosophy departments instead of wasting so much time on philosophies which basically aren't leading us anywhere. Well, thank you for that. Uh, that was a wonderful chat. I really enjoyed it. And well, I'm just doing you. So. <laughs> oh well, there's a lot more to say, and of course, um, a lot of people are saying it. It's 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 an interesting time in Canada intellectually um, if we're listening to the right voices. I guess um, I'm going to see if Sanjoy is around. I, I believe that um, he will close up the session because we can talk forever if you let us. Yeah. <laughs> And I want to hear a lot more about Nepal, which I've not been to. So this is, uh, you know. John Ralston, Saul, Manjushri Thapa, truly, we do you injustice by trying to fit you into a 45-minute session. I mean, we could have listened to you all carry on forever. And, and John, as you said, you know, hopefully the young will come forward, will take over power. But will the people in power, people, our roughly our generation, will they hand it over? Uh, to these young people? Will they empower them? Will they allow them? I think that's the big issue in terms of where money lies. And, you know, I, I think that the best solution that you've come up with is, hey, sign off that all of this money that you've printed, put it into that drawer and say 250 years later, we look at paying it back and throw away the key. I, I do hope world leaders, I mean, you're able to address world leaders or you know, and get them, get their attention in September at the UN and give this to them as a solution uh, to, to the problem that we have. If not, as you said, the poor, as they always do, will continue to bear the burden 
of unpreparedness in so many different ways. But, but thank you both so much. I mean, that was just, you know, a, a, a tweet a moment kind of conversation. And uh, I do <laughs> hope uh, and people will continue to listen to this uh, on our site. Uh, over the weeks and over the coming months. And uh, thank you all for listening. And I'm sorry, as you, it, it was such an interesting conversation and we saw all of the questions coming in. But we weren't, Manjushri wasn't able to pose all of them. We weren't able to uh, send all of them. But, but, but we promised perhaps if you'd send, some of them, we'll, we'll send it forward and get John and Manjushri to answer some of those. Uh, thank you to our official radio partners, Red FM, Bajati Raho. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed this and we'll be back at 8.30 p.m. for our next session. A.K. Ramanujan, A Poet's Diary, Krishna Ramanujan and Yermo Rodriguez in conversation. The legendary poet, folklorist, translator and scholar A.K. Ramanujan left an indelible mark on the understanding and appreciation of Indian literature. After his premature death in 1993, Ramanujan's personal journals, diaries and notes referred to as the A.K.R. papers remained with the University of Chicago till his son, Krishna Ramanujan and Yermo Rodriguez edited, published them as Journeys, a Poet's Diary. Come discover, see you at 8.30.